afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm ex excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and this month's theme is poultry technology. On today's call, we're joined by Matthew Wadiak, CEO, Cook's Venture. Cook's Venture is building an alternative to America's meat industry delivering great food from independent regional farms directly to customers. Its core values include a commitment to true transparency and prioritizing the health of the land and the well-being of our workers. From poultry to beef to seafood, the company is focused on foods that are good for both of us and the planet. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We invite you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Cook's Ventures market. You are potential customers for Cook's Ventures products and services. You've built a company similar to Cook's Venture, or uh, you have unique expertise uh, and understand the challenges and opportunities that Cook's Venture may face. Now, before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And while that poll is running, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information, helps Cook's Venture find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships they can help them grow their business. You can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we'll answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Matthew Wadiak, CEO of Cook's Venture. Matthew, please free take it away. Hey, thanks so much for having me today. And thanks for really for everyone who joined and who's interested in the space and ag. And really, it's my goal over the course of this uh, brief uh, time that we have together to explain a little bit more about our industry, some of the knowledge that might not have been out there that folks um, might not realize today, and, and and really dig in deeper to discuss what the advantages are with vertical supply chain, regenerative agriculture, and how that fits into different kinds of systems, including monogastrics, ruminants, cropping systems, and, and how we can utilize those vertically in circular economies. So let me go ahead and kick it off here and, and take us away. First and foremost, one of the things that I've found, which is really industry, interesting, is that the industry, the genetics industry, is really run by just two companies. Avigen and Cobb on the poultry side. And if you go back to about 1960, there were about 160 separate genetics companies that were producing parent stock birds for uh, broiler companies around the world. And that's really come down to two businesses. One of them's owned by Tyson. It's called Cobb. The other one is called Avigen, which is wholly owned by EW Group in Germany. And when we talk about poultry genetics, let me just go ahead and explain what that means for folks who might not be super familiar with that. Poultry genetics is when you go to the grocery store to buy a chicken, you might wonder, where did this chicken come from? And it's the chicken egg question. And the way that the entire integrated industry works, whether it's Tyson or Purdue or Cook's Venture or, or Bell Evans or any chicken company that's on this list here, is that they buy what they call parent stock chickens, female chickens, hens, and they buy roosters. And they mate those roosters and hens together in what are called breeder houses. And they produce eggs and hatch the eggs. And then they grow those chicks that they hatch from those parent stock and produce the 8 billion chickens that we consume every year in America. And the difference between Cook's Venture and every other company is that Cook's Venture actually produces the breeders from pedigree birds and further generations and works with heritage lines to improve the health and where welfare of those birds throughout those lines. The Cornish cross chickens that have been common in the industry have been aggregated to just those two businesses. So really we, we have heard a lot in the news lately about integration of poultry, big poultry, big chicken, white striping, all the news articles that I'm sure you've all, all heard. That's really derived not from these individual brands as companies, but from the genetics who are really over the brands and only those two companies provide 99% of the breeds for all these different brands here, Tyson's, George's, Pilgrim's Pride, Wayne Farms, 
Purdue, Sanderson, Coke Foods, the really big companies. So we do that all internally, and we are the only company in America that does that internally. And that's compelling for a number of reasons, and I'll, I'll get into that. First of all, one of the issues associated with these breeding lines is that through overselection of these breeding lines over the course of about 50, 60 years, breeding companies have for profit, and obviously that's a good thing, tried to select birds that were efficient in the field. They're trying to make through doing that. And to do that, they've selected under the criteria of breast meat. So you go to the, the grocery store today versus maybe 10 years ago, you might have seen a chicken breast 10 years ago that was a small eight ounce chicken breast in a, in a pack and maybe two per pack. Now you go to the grocery store and you see something that's a one pound or one and a half pound single chicken breast. And that's because these birds are being bred and selected to grow faster, much more quickly, and have much larger breasts for white meat to meet the demand of American consumers. The problem with that is for every single extra ounce of breast meat that you produce, for every single gain in feed conversion that you produce, you're taking something away from the animal's metabolic energy to efficiently produce healthier muscle, healthier organs, have the ability to stand up and walk, et cetera. And, and what's really happened over the course of this 70 years of really intense selection is that it's been really help, it's been really difficult to improve the uh, bird health due to a lot of inbreeding. So the genetic pool for selection has shrunk because there are only so many selections you can make in a single breed. So since the 1950s, as I was saying, there were 130 companies out there. Actually, I think I said 160 earlier. It's 130. Now there's only two, Cobb and Avigen. And the, this intense selection has eliminated a healthy genetic reservoir. So if we just keep selecting these same birds over and over, there's not enough genetic reservoir material in terms of biodiversity to create healthy birds and fix the problem. We really have to start from square one to solve this issue. And the way we do that, starting from square one, is we took these really healthy birds. As you can see, if you go back the slide, you saw that bird. This is one of our birds standing on a tree limb outside. And you just notice the length of its legs, the way it appears, the way it walks, the way it can stand. That's the criteria of selecting for better leg health because we have a large genetic reservoir and have diversity within our breeding mix to improve the quality of these animals. And also, we have the ability to do a few really cool things like this is a picture of one of our male naked neck chickens. It's not supposed to have feathers on its neck just for everybody's, everybody out there, but our males are actually white and our females are red. So we have the ability to separate those birds out at birth and grow them to different target growth, growth rates based on sex. So that's one of the proprietary genetic IP uh, traits that we have in our wheelhouse is breeding birds for color sexing to have some birds could lay eggs, some birds could be harvest for, harvested for meat, and we can see that by color as opposed to um, traditional means of sexing chickens, which is vent sexing or feather sexing, which is very expensive and technical to, to do. And the other things that we select these healthier chickens for is for single stage feed and their ability to digest single stage feed. Modern conventional industrial breeding companies have selected birds on predominantly corn and soy feeds that are usually at least three, if not up to five stages of feed through the animal's short life. So you'll have one blend of nutrients for a starter feed, another blend of nutrients for a grower feed, another blend of nutrients for a finisher feed. The problem with that is in this world of transportation where supply chain is already tight, mixing different batches and delivering different batches of feed to the same chicken house over and over again throughout the course of the bird's life is very logistically complicated. And the other problem is it limits the things that you can feed a chicken. So when you select a bird from a pedigree level, like five generations before the broiler on what's called a single stage feed, the bird has the ability to digest more things. So our bird can do really well on things like regenerative crops, like, like sorghum and sunflower and a cover crop wheat and field pea and things like that are not based in corn and soy specifically. So that single stage feed has an enzymatic advantage biologically to digest more complex feedstock and build regenerative systems. And also has the ability, this bird to go outside, eat actual bugs, eat off of the grass a little bit and get some of its supplemental nutrition from the outdoors. 
So that those are some of the differences in, in selection criteria and some of the ways that we look at breeding, breeding health and welfare along with efficiency into a better chicken. And here's really the difference. And like you saw the difference in the chicken, but really, if you look at it, if you go to the grocery store and you look at the meat, you'll get this chicken on the left, this white striping chicken, woody breasted, bland taste. And there, a lot of you might've seen the Bloomberg feature that just came out a couple of weeks ago that shows that 99% of grocery store chicken is white, has white striping in it, which is a unnatural uh, myopathy. It's a veterinary disease actually. So we're eating 99% of our chicken from Cornish cross chickens that have this muscular myopathy. If one of you found out from your doctor that you had a myopathy, that would not be a good thing for reference. And then on the right here, we have our chicken, which has been bred for healthier muscle, for muscle that's more active, that doesn't have uh, myopathy and doesn't have woody breasts and is more flavorful, but is also better for the animal. It allows the animal to actually move around and be physically active. Birds with myopathies have a difficult time walking and moving because although it's more muscle, it's actually not activated muscle. It's sick muscle. It's really important that, that, that this is something that consumers are becoming increasingly aware of and market demand through better chicken commitment and other folks are, are making this more and more clear to the market that this is a big deal. And this is just a quote from Bloomberg. 10 years ago, this poultry muscle disease known as white striping was almost non-existent. Now the fat boosting ailment shows up in 99% of, of meat in the grocery stores. And of course, it's in 99% of meat in the grocery stores because 99% of the chickens come from the same Cornish cross breed. So we should not be surprised by that. But there's a way to fix it. We need more genetic reservoir. We need more people growing slow growing chickens and healthier chickens. Just to give you an idea of the market size of what that means, and you might say, okay, that's great. How big is the market size of slower growing chicken? And when you look at breeder sales, the, the genetics in the country, you're talking about a massive market size for people who are committed to slower growing chickens to, to the tune of about $332 million per, per year, about 10% of the global market of folks who are committed to slower growing chicken and just in the US alone about 7.4 billion per year of better, uh, better chicken commitment companies. So companies like Chipotle and Sweet Green and Whole Foods and big organizations that constitute a little bit over 11% of the industry have actually already committed to saying, we are going to leave behind the fast growing conventional breeds and move over by 2024 or 2026 to uh, chickens that have the kind of traits that our chickens have. So slower growing chickens. So the market and the demand have a, an unparalleled mismatch today. And the reason why that's important is it takes really long to cultivate these breeds. So the sort of tailwinds that we see coming at us is we have now a, a study that's coming out from, the, the, from GAP, the uh, Global Animal Partnership and the BCC, Better Chicken Commitment, strong consumer awareness through a lot of press. Over 200 companies like Chipotle have committed to BCC by 2024. And then just the headlines have, have not been ceasing. They're just increasing in velocity. As a result of the, the GAP study, which are gonna be actually announced next week, are gonna be coming out and hitting the mainstream. So the BCC Better Chicken Commitment is gonna mandate that all of their chickens to be BCC accredited are gonna to have to be slow growing within that time period. So we're about to enter a, a tidal wave of demand. And that tidal wave of demand is problematic because it takes, once you're able to do genetic improvement up here at the pedigree level. So if you're looking at the breeding nucleus, it's called pedigrees. Then you have what's called uh, great grandparents at the second tier, then grandparents where they're crossed as F1s. If you guys can think back to high school biology, the F1 cross leads you to the F2 and you cross that F2 and you get to your broiler line. The problem is each one of these different sections of the pyramid takes about 26 weeks to produce. So you're talking about 26 weeks, a year, and now you're into two years. Now you're into two and a half years to go through a single generation. To really go through a proper selection criteria at a pedigree level, you need to do that about five times before you can have a desirable broiler product at the end of the line. So the market potential is there, the supply is there, the, in terms of genetic potential up top, but to get to a final product, 
we're the only company in America right now that has a commercialized final product, which means we have about a 10 to 12 year advantage over any company starting today. So like company like Cobra Avigen, multi-billion dollar company might say, hey, we've got a lot of money, we can fix this problem. Sure, they can fix it, but they're 10 to 15 years from being able to fix the problem because they have to go through the same genetic selection and criteria as anybody starting a program like this. And we've been doing it for a little over 12, going on 13 years now. So we're in our fifth generation of uh, broiler stock coming through this continuous selection at the breeder level. And that's just a huge advantage in our business. And we hope to see more folks start these projects to build more diversity over time. But as it sits today, we're the only company that's focused on doing it. One of the things that also makes our breed just better for the environment and better for agricultural systems is because we have this single stage feed, we're allowed to genetically select our pedigree birds based on dig digestibility to alternative feeds. So things like sorghum and sunflower and peas, like I mentioned earlier, but then we can continue to select those alternative feed ingredients and refine genetic selection based on feed conversion. So if you think about it like this, if you select a chicken to eat sorghum, the broiler five generations later will be eating sorghum efficiently. If you select a chicken to eat corn, the uh, broiler five generations later will be selected to eat corn very efficiently. And it's just as human beings, certain cultures have allergies to milk or to lactose or to gluten based on a lot of that is like how we grew up and our exposure to those things and the anthropology and our genetics. Chickens and animals are no different. You can select animals under the criteria of selecting for enzymatic ability to digest nutrients and anti-nutrients. So here's a picture from one of our selection houses. It just goes through us selecting criteria on different feed trials. And then once that happens, we can build markets for alternative grains with big companies on millions of acres of land to really be impactful, to grow crops in the right rotation. So when you think about an organic system, you might grow corn and soy in an organic system, but you need several other crops, which have been traditionally difficult to monetize to get into animal feed. And because a little bit over half of the grain we produce in our country goes into feeding animals, it's the biggest gateway to become a regenerative company is finding offtake for the small grains, which are byproducts of corn and soy. So again, oats, red winter wheat, cover crops, things like yellow pea, those are all excellent alternative ingredients that we can select for those criteria and then build, build that criteria and the demand for that, deliver it, and then eliminate some of those synthetic inputs associated with the non-organic systems, which can actually be cost savings because we're not adding, we're subtracting, and we're becoming efficient by feeding animals. And what that does over time is it protects our soil. So when we think about soil, we think about what are the pillars of soil? Soil health, obviously, by measuring that through organic matter in soil and understanding complexity of soil and root systems, biodiversity, having really good biodiverse soil with good fungal life, a lot of different microbial healthy activity within the soil, integrated pest management, the elimination of herbicides and pesticides and synthetics in soil. When you're growing crops in the right location, you don't have the same kind of pest pressure. So you're, you're naturally eliminating those things, those inputs from the soil. And then the last thing is integrated, uh, besides integrated pest management, it is energy use on farm. So we're trying to eliminate the use of petrochemical fertilizers on farm by, by planting pulses that are fixing nitrogen in soil and give us healthy returns then on small grain crops without the need for such extensive use of, of petrochemicals. So that's what the chickens can provide. And, and here's a little bit how it has to work. Without building circular economies around these things, it's virtually impossible to create soil health, to create better birds. So what we do at our company we decided to say, okay, the industry is doing this. We're just going to pull the ripcord and we're going to be crazy and start the first vertically integrated genetics uh, chicken company in 50 years in America. So we do the genetics. We, we started breeding our birds 12 years ago, and it's a combination of an old Italian line called the Transylvanian Naked and Neck, two versions of the Delaware Heritage line that came from a farm in Delaware in the 1920s, and then a version of the Peterson male from the 1930s. That my, my partner's grandfather had the rights to, and he, he inherited. So we were able to cultivate these heritage genetics in such a way to breed these amazing chickens. And then, of course, we take them through and replicate them in our breeding operation, which down here, 
mating males and females, producing the pedigree stock, the grandparent stock, the great grandparent stock. We hatch all of those birds. We call our broiler the pioneer because we're pioneering a new food system and pioneering a new kind of bird. And we have dedicated hatching facilities down here in Northwest Arkansas where we do that. We also grow this, the birds. We grow about 15% of the chickens here on our farm in Arkansas. And then we have a co-op of growers that all trains on our farm and converts their houses to fully pasture raised houses. And in conjunction with that, we um, planted this year alone 21,000 hazelnut trees to build silvopasture systems where the birds are going outside. They're fertilizing the hazelnut trees, the grass, the shrubs, the fruit trees. The trees grow. The chickens get a lot of benefit from shade and from uh, predator protection from those trees, and they thrive outdoors. And these birds, when I say they go outside, they it's like kids going out to recess. They're just running out the doors and they're going crazy. Then we have a processing plant in Jay Oklahoma, about 20 minutes away. We actually process the birds and then we take them into packaging and sell them and deliver them to our customers in all of the lower 48 states and in Hawaii. So we're in 40, 49 states and occasionally we'll get an Alaska customer in e-commerce and we'll send them a care box from us. So that's really what we do. And we found out that really the only way to make a dent in such a, an integrated industry is to become integrators ourselves and really own our own supply chain. That means that an integrator can't cut us off from genetics. It means an integrator can't say, I don't like what you're doing. We're not going to process your chickens anymore. They can't tell us we're not going to grow your chickens anymore. We won't package them. So we have the ability to control our own future and our communications independently without the risk of that kind of integrator management, which has traditionally stepped in and acquired companies to close them down to reduce competition. So we have a great advantage there. Where do we sell our chicken today? We sell our chicken in a lot of different places. And if you guys don't know, my background is I was the founder and COO of Blue Apron for six years. And we were a strictly D2C based company uh, during my tenure there. I left after our IPO to acquire this company. And one of the things, the learnings of being in a strictly D2C business is that diversity of supply chain is great. Cost of acquisition can be high at certain times of year. We all know for you guys who have been in the acquisition a channel mix loss of signal in iOS 14 has been problematic from, an, from a CAC perspective for a lot of folks out there. So why, how do we control that? We got to go into distributors. We got to go into bricks and mortar. We work with online retailers too, like Thrive Market and Imperfect Foods and CrowdCow and great folks out there who are selling our birds. And then we do about 30% of our business in D2C ourselves, but we manage that and control it in, in accordance with the balance of our other customers to manage supply chain efficiently. The other nice thing about selling in D2C and through other channels is that you can sell frozen chicken. So we can pack chicken, freeze it. And if we're a little long on inventory, a little short on inventory, other weeks, it helps balance out supply chain efficiencies in a way that's really controllable and, and nice to handle. So we work with all those different folks. This is, is something that's being recorded. So you can go back and read through the fine tune notes after this. But the bottom line is we have more demand than supply today. And increasingly, we're just seeing a, a growing drumbeat of retailers and consumers out there who care about what's going into their bodies. They care about what's getting sold into their stores. And folks really want to know, where do I get better food and how do I trust that food for myself and my family? And that's the growing category. Just for some high level numbers and context, last year we were doing 10.2 million annualized run rate and we we're selling for about a buck, a buck 46 per pound. That's already about 2x the commodity chicken price that's on the market today. To, and we were just in distributors, retailers. We really only had whole chickens and, and we're selling chickens in these bulk kind of like restaurant style packages. We've grown even despite COVID, which had as its own unique challenges. We've grown to 400% during that time period to 40 million plus annualized run rate. And we're now at over a buck 90 a pound. So we've grown not only our revenue, we've grown our birds, we've grown our run rate, we've grown our pricing. And the really cool thing is we're launching all these cool new tray packs, we're launching marinated products. We have a broth that we're doing with Kettle and Fire, which is the first certified regenerative broth, which we're really excited about. It's going to be grocery stores around the country. And we launched what I think is going to be the biggest thing, chicken nuggets. Everybody wants a guilt-free nugget and it doesn't exist. So we have the first pasture-raised heirloom 
gluten-free, grain-free chickpea nugget. It's breaded with this chickpea flour. Hey, they're absolutely phenomenal. If none of you reach out for any other reason, go uh, try the nuggets because they're just like stellar out of this world. I'm addicted to them. And then, you know, where we're selling today, we're selling in Italy, Union Market, Air One, Berkeley Bowl, all of the movers, all of the big influential organizations that picked us up. Those are the early adopters. We also sell to Trader Joe's around the country and Whole Foods within our region. And then we're signing up some new customers, Meyer, Publix, like different big box retailers that are interested in working to improve their chicken programs. And people really care. It's just going to show the trend that goes from like Michelin Chef to Italy, to Union Market, to food trucks, to value stores, to higher ESG stores, to the big box stores who everybody wants to get somebody into their store and put that center of the plate item in their cart and go around and improve their basket rings. We've done quite a few studies on this actually and versus competitors. We tend to outsell our competitors like in the natural channel about 30% more in revenue store by store on a weekly basis. So we're excited about that. And we've seen great feedback from our customers. Here's a woman that says, I certainly, I'm certain your chicken could stand on its own, its own on top of the delicious chart. I'll buy it again from Imperfect Foods. Crowd Cow, I discovered Cook's Venture through Crowd Cow. I've been on a health journey these last couple of months trying to consume high quality food choices. I have to say, this is the best chicken I've ever had. I like hearing that. The quality is impeccable. Tell everyone about your chicken. Bobby Parrish, big food influencer. He's got about a million followers. He just says it's next level. And then Tamara from our website, this chicken is what chicken is all about. Cook per perfectly every time. It's the way chicken should taste. And you know, the bottom line is that chicken should taste like chicken. It shouldn't taste like a rubber sandal. And the last one, and I have to, I hate reading off slides usually, but I'm going to do this one because I'm in love with this woman. If you guys know Alice Waters, she was the founder of the natural food movement in America. All good food that we eat at restaurants today can be traced back to her. And what she said to me, I had her over for dinner in New York before COVID. And she said, I've been so focused on organic for so long that I've completely forgotten about breed. That's the missing piece. Matt's birds are delicious, Cook's Venture. They taste like the, ch the chicken I ate in France before opening Chez Panisse. So that melts my heart because I did an, an internship with Alice when I was a 20-year-old kid out of culinary school and got my butt kicked in, in the kitchens in California. And for her to come around 25 years later and say that is, is really special. These are product lines that we have today from our, our, our branded wogs to our tray pack to our TJs and our Thrive Market stuff. We work with like amazing, beautiful guys like Force of Nature, Kettle and Fire, we have our Hacks marinated chicken in, in uh, Whole Foods, Southern California and online. Then our chicken nuggets, our broth. And then actually, if you go online, our, our chicken sausages just launched this week and they're, they're really delicious. And this is a little bit about our team. Finding a great team is the secret to success. We have myself and my business partner, Blake Evans, who has been in the poultry business since he was a boy. You know, his grandfather started the farm that we operated on today in 1939. So we have some family nostalgia there. We're really proud of the work that the regenerative work that we do on our farm. Ankur Agrawal, who worked with me at Blue, at Blue Apron and has had a very diverse background in, in food and beverage. Mark Fisher said decades in the poultry business from Wayne Farm to Zaki. And he just said, enough is enough. I want to do something that's better for the world. And he came and joined us and it's been awesome in our operation. Richard Udale. I, what can I say about Richard Udale? He was the he he was a guy who developed all of those Cornish cross breeds back in the '80s and said to me a couple months ago, "I want to spend my time at Cook's Venture correcting all the mistakes that I made in selection over the course of my my 40 something years in the business." He was the president of the Poultry Breeders Roundtable Symposium is one of the most respected geneticists in the world. And then Fariba, who also has a PhD in genetics and is running our regenerative farming practices and making sure that we're keeping things up to snuff around here in terms of our regenerative mandates, our team, our facilities. And then of course is extremely knowledgeable of our birds as a geneticist. And then Chiosum Eric, who came from Nigeria and started hanging birds in his first job in a Purdue plant, and then worked his way up and ran, ended up running the most successful agrostats Purdue plant in the entire country. I just love, 
of his story and, and put himself through two college degrees while I was doing that. And we just have a, a, a rock star team and I can't speak more highly of them. Let's see, I think, I think uh, in terms of slides, that's it guys. So I think that's a good time to go into to Q and A. So do you want me to keep the, some slides up here or would you rather, uh, rather go to the full screen? Here? Totally fine to keep them up in case um, they're, they're helpful to refer back to at any point if there's any questions. Yeah. As First of all, Matthew, thank you for the presentation. Congrats on all the progress and all the success. As someone who has followed a number of regenerative meat brands and tried to find ways to buy these types of products, it's really amazing what you guys have done. If there are questions from the audience, now's a great time. The best way to ask a question is by typing it in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box, and I will answer all questions in the order that they're received. But I can kick things off here, and maybe I hope it's not too big and open-ended of a question, because, but, I, but I don't think it is because I think you've shown the ability to be in a lot of places and in a lot of different types of products. Because I think one of the things that people talk about, and I was at this regenerative agriculture conference in, in Oakland recently, and mm -hmm. they talked a lot about challenges of scale and the ability to scale these types of products and these types of solutions. And when I think about regenerative farming products that are regenerative in nature, I think about it more from a context of I'm, as a consumer, I'm probably going to eat less meat in the future. But when I do, I like to eat really awesome high quality products that not only taste great, that I can feel great about and everybody else is really excited about them. And they have a great story around them. But notoriously, those are types of products that are typically more expensive and they don't translate super well into things like chicken nuggets, for example. Like you can buy the whole bird, but like you might not be able to create the types of traditional, almost fast food type products um, that you might come to expect from traditional chicken, which is extremely cheap. So I'm, I'm curious to know, as you guys have built this company out and built your product lines out and your partnerships over the last, why well, you talked about the growth over the last year, but it sounds like you've been working on this for a decade almost and through the genetic story. And how, how do you guys think about the true scalability of a regeneratively farmed product and like how many places it can be and whether or not it should reflect the way chickens consume today or if it reflects a new paradigm and perhaps the way that we consume meat? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll rewind a little bit and, and tell you how we got here. When I was a young cook, I was volunteering to work on farms and I was working in like really nice restaurants. And I, I went, spent about a year working over in Italy and was eating just like great meals with my family. My, my family is a very blue collar family. Um, my stepfather who raised me worked in a plant and is an engineer grew up working in machine shops. And so I went over to Italy and I stayed with my grandparents who live in Milan and a very small apartment, but we ate well and we ate good vegetables and they have systems in Europe for growing food that are obviously a lot, a lot different than what we do here in the States. And it was interesting when I came back to the U.S. to cook that the kind of blue collar food we would eat in our family meals in, in Italy is something that I was cooking for customers. And you would have to be a pretty wealthy person to, I couldn't afford to eat the, the meals I was cooking, $100, $150 for a person to eat at a restaurant back in the late 90s, early 2000s is a lot of money. And I started asking myself, why is it so expensive to have good food here? But why is it so accessible in other parts of the world? And started working on farms and realizing, man, these farmers have like four to eight farmers per small farm. Even the mid-sized farmers don't have that many employees. You send a three or four of them to a farmer's market for a day. You have gas, you're driving them down there. You got to pay people. Those are people who aren't working on the farm that day. And then you have all these other costs of land and real estate and maintenance and all this stuff. And food becomes really expensive. And I said, well, there's got to be better ways to do this in scale. So when I started Blue Apron, we started saying, hey, the farmer's markets are great. I still go to farmer's markets, but let me guarantee a full harvest from you. And let's write a recipe around that. And let's figure that out. And let's figure out how to 
grow better food in scale and create better cost economics for farmers, spend more of your time on the farm, utilize your variable labor more efficiently, send me full truckloads of product instead of sending me a case or a little bag of something in a CSA box. And we had a lot of success with that. We were able to pay farmers more. Farmers were able to earn more profit because they needed less employees and we lowered the variable inefficiencies. And the reality is it's not expensive to grow good food but all of the variable costs associated with distributing it and marketing it and um, trucking it around and selling it are what gets marked up two, 300% by the time it gets to most customers. And then we waste 40% of it on our plates in addition to all of that. When I started looking at use of land though, after partnering with about 250 farms like that and regenerative systems and measuring their soil and trying to do all these great things, I was like, man, we must be really impactful to the environment. We're buying a lot of freaking food. But I ran the math on it. And as it turns out, all of the, the, the annuals, the fruits, the nuts, the vegetables, and the basic consumable stuff that we were growing that wasn't meat only actually account for 3% of America's agriculture. I don't know how many people realize that, but we could have been, if every single vegetable farmer and, and nut farmer in America was regenerative, we're, not, we're still not going to move the needle in terms of soil health and climate change. So you start looking into that other 97%, and it's, it's row crops. It's all of the arable lands that are row crops. And our biggest crop in our country is corn. Where does corn go? 50% of it's going to ethanol and an energy loss. That's a problem. I'm not in a position as a food guy to go up against the, the big oil companies and the ethanol companies and the subsidies, but I think regardless of what your personal opinions on this call is, my opinion is firmly like, we got to stop growing gasoline in the ground and depleting our soil and using gasoline to grow it through ammonium nitrate and, and natural gas byproducts. It's just ridiculous. Number two goes to, to feeding cattle, the use of corn in America. And we have all of this compromised land in our country that's non-tillable soil, that's not glacial topsoil, and we're growing really valuable crops, really valuable nutrition, and we're feeding them to a beast that's biologically designed to convert cellular material in the form of grass and shrubs into simple carbohydrates and build bone and muscle. So this idea of grass-fed cattle, which is something that's been going on for thousands of years, and in some countries they call feed grass, like in New Zealand and Australia. And here we are feeding our cattle corn. We got to stop doing that. We got to build systems where we can figure out how to grow cattle and run plants and, and freeze when necessary and have year round supply of cattle and, and have dual purpose plants that can harvest other things and keep people employed while also harvesting cattle off of America's abundant grasslands, which by the way, would be greatly improved if we grew more cattle and finished them on grasses in our native pastures. And then the next biggest cohort of animal that we can affect through soil change is poultry, which consumes about 20% of America's corn and a lot of the other soy and row crops. And if we can take that in, the cohort that's addressable, a monogastric animal that requires to be fed row crops, which by the way, the two big ones are chickens and pigs, but ch chickens are ahead of pigs in terms of how much they consume by percentage. And we're able to cultivate that animal from a breeding standpoint to become selected to affect land and scale, millions of acres of land through eating things like sorghum, winter wheat as a cover crop, pea, which is, uh, fixes an incredible amount of nitrogen in the soil, and uh, sunflower, which has incredible tap roots, and cultivate animals to eat those things. We can not only really massively improve the quality of soil, but now we can create circular economies with a bird that can eat different things. So it's not just about American land. This is a global problem. So if this chicken can eat a lot of stuff. It can eat cassava in South America. It can eat Kernza in Africa. It can eat different kinds of grains and crops in Asia. So we have the availability of this low, low density feedstock, which is highly digestible and diverse to being omnivorous and eating a lot of different things efficiently. Right. So it's the circular economy and the ability to impact millions of acres of land through breed and selection of breed that is fascinating to me. And that's what got us to, to where we are today. That's really interesting. It makes me think a little bit about some of, maybe you could, could you pull up your partnership slide again real quick, just like where you guys, the, just some of your, your, your product partners and, and distribution partners, et cetera. 
This one or? No, the one that has the logos on it. So just thinking like we've had version one of the plant-based meats movement come along. And um, first it was in like boutique restaurants. And then, you know, all of a sudden you, you could get an impossible Whopper at Burger King. And, and no, no matter what you pick in that case, at either whether you pick the Whopper or the impossible Whopper, you're, you're probably not getting anything that's that good for you. But if you're going, if you have to go there and you buy the impossible Whopper because it, you know, would have a principally a lower environmental footprint in consuming that product or an ethical um, benefit, depending on how you feel about those types of products. The regenerative story is like more complicated and obviously like still newer in them. I think you ask the average person what their thoughts are on regenerative farming. The average person probably may not have a, a well-formulated opinion or may have not heard of the concept or may not be super aware. What do you think, what do you think has to be true for those types of restaurants that are starting to adopt these alternative products where like when you really think about it, the regenerative meat story has a super compelling like quality, impact, nutrition story around it. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we start? How does it? How, what, what needs to be true for that to start to shift so that it's not just like terrible meat and plant based meat, but also because the opportunity for that there's this this awesome option and it's like good for you and it like it's good for the planet and it tastes amazing. Like what yeah. that third skew in there alongside traditional meat and plant based meat. I think, I think it's education. And, and I, I, by the way, I think as well as Impossible and, and some of the other meat companies have, fake meat companies have done, listen, they've taken a lot of inputs out of animals, but they're still cultivating the same kind of soil science practices that are equally problematic. It's not solving the problem, it's slowing it down. And there's nothing regenerative about that. So I think what's important is that I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head either earlier like you don't eat that much meat you eat less meat and i think it's okay to eat less meat it's okay to eat more vegetables it's okay to eat more whole grains but when you eat meat let's make more ethical choices about the meat we're eating and we're not eating meat we're eating what that meat eats and that's what's really fundamentally important so when you bite into a piece of chicken or a piece of beef or whatever you're consuming what that animal consumed. And that's how you're affecting land. And I think the disconnect has been part of the problem. But the fact that there's been such a willingness to, to commercialize Impossible and beyond just goes to show that there's a huge market segment for that. And the only market segment that's bigger than those categories and growing in those categories today is the actual meat industry. Having a chicken that's better for you and that's better for the environment, just for context, for every acre of land that we put our chickens out on pasture, that is equivalent to annualized 40 acres of land that we're growing feed on. So it's a 40 to one ratio. We have hundreds and hundreds of acres that we're growing chickens on. And that equates to tens of thousands of acres that to hundreds of thousands of acres that we're growing feed on. And if we can eat a chicken sandwich, and again, we have customers who are like Rome Burger in uh, the Bay Area. We have a, a pop-up that we're doing with some burger places out in Atlanta. And it doesn't have to be fancy. We have food truck, Mexican food trucks that are making burritos out of our stuff. Nice. It doesn't have to be really expensive food to be able to make that impact to land and know and know that when you're consuming those things maybe it's a dollar more expensive for your burrito or 50 cents more expensive for for your chicken burger or chicken sandwich but to know that you're making that impact and by the way it's also going to be more nutritious for you it's going to have less water weight in it it's going to be go it's, it's going to be an animal that didn't have suffering in its life because it was able to walk around and go outside that's really compelling. And then the last thing is it just tastes better. Like good meat, the bottom line is one of my mentors and best friends in the world is Bill Nyman, the founder of Nyman Ranch. And the thing that he always told me was that, listen, man, you can put together, you can put together an, a, an animal meat product, a sausage or a hot dog or a burger or whatever it is. And people will buy it one time, 
because it's for the ESG reasons, it's environmentally better, it's a lower footprint, it's whatever. But if you take it home and it doesn't taste good, most people won't buy it again. So one of our goals is we select for the criteria of flavor, much in the same kind of way that Blue Hill Stone Barns might select the squash for more sweetness and for more flavor. This idea that selection for flavor, which has been lost, we just look for yield in our country genetically, traditionally over the last few decades. But people used to think about flavor. When you think about an heirloom tomato or you, when you think about an old cultivar of a brassica, people selected for flavor and people used to select meat for flavor too, Angus Amber, uh, the uh, Angus uh, Amberdeen cattle or Murray Grays or you know, heritage pork like Berkshires and Duroc's and, and animals like that were selected for flavor. And we want to do that with chicken because that's the thing that's been overlooked and that's what we've been robbing consumers of. So if we can just give people what they want, we can give them something that tastes good and they get the added benefit of feeling good about the meat that they're eating and knowing that they can do something better about the environment. We're checking a lot of boxes in a category that's actually a lot bigger than meat substitutes. I think it, it highlights a really important shift that I think, I, I hope captivates a lot of people when they think about quality of food and how big of an impact that, that can have on the planet and on themselves. And really appreciate the work you guys are doing to help make that a part of the story for poultry and some other, and other products as well. We certainly run longer than our traditional agri-foods. This has been really fun. We like to give all of our guests the opportunity to make an ask of the audience. If there's anything that the audience can help you out with today, feel free to let us know. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. My ask of the audience is, if you have more questions about what we're doing or how you can contribute to building a better food system or become more involved with our company in some capacity, we want to share knowledge. We want to see, instead of two breeding companies, obviously we want to have, uh, we're a business too, we want to have some market, but we want to see more companies emerge. We need diversity in supply chain, just like we need biodiversity in nature. We can't have two monopolies running an entire industry that's the most eaten food on the planet. It's become ridiculous. And if there's one takeaway, share that with your friends and family, that there's just two companies out there doing all this, and we need to support alternatives. So whatever that means to you, and if you want to reach out to me personally, my email is matt at cooksventure.com. Shoot me a note. I'm happy to hop on the phone with anyone, and we can talk more about it. Fantastic. Matthew, thank you so much uh, for your time today. And congratulations again on all the progress to date. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for your participation and for watching this either live or on. We host agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, if you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do a replay will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. And new viewers can register for agri-food conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, Matthew, thanks so much for your time. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Take care.